Welcome to another edition of CBC Arts Exhibitionists. I'm your host, Amanda Paris. Today we're in Toronto inside an immersive art maze designed to inspire your imagination and your selfies. It's called The Fun House, and everything you'll see in here has been brought to life by visual artists and local musicians. I'm gonna talk to one of the artists and learn more about what inspired his designs. In this episode, we'll also meet a tattoo artist pushing boundaries. We'll visit a painter capturing the Canadian landscape with traditional Chinese techniques. We'll see a drag artist inspired by video game technology. And we'll find out how the brightest color palette is helping an abstract painter. <laughs> developed this kind of process of creating these installations just for myself to interact with. So it's been a really like personal process for me and I think that's something that I really value. My name is Seamus Gallagher. I'm a 23 year old artist currently based in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'm interested in the intersection of performance, new media and photography. I think this interdisciplinary approach to creating art has been just so formative for me. I do mostly self-portraiture, so for me it's being able to perform in front of a camera and having complete control over what others see in my performance. I didn't think about it too much at the time, but when I was 12 years old playing RuneScape, I would often choose to play as a female character. And so just thinking about that connection to my work now in relation to drag, I think there was a funny root of my interests starting with RuneScape. My process when starting a photograph uh, begins with the computer. I 3D model these kind of drag personas, and then I have a program that turns these 3D models into paper templates that I can then cut out and construct physically. And so for my photographs, I wear these masks and these costumes as a way of blurring this digital and physical space within my photography. Something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is whether or not it's healthy to shut off the world and just get lost in your own kind of world. The internet is so ubiquitous and inescapable that I think it's important to realize the negative impacts that it has on society, but also focus as well on the positive potentials that it carries. I think platforms like Instagram can really place a lot of pressure on artists to continue pumping out work at a speed that isn't really conducive to taking a step back and allowing yourself to process why you're making the work you are. My favorite piece that I've created so far was the first one where I really started utilizing video game technologies within the photo. It was the first one where I thought, this is a unique voice that I'm, that I'm speaking with. One of my professors would always say, pay attention to what you pay attention to, which is something that I take to heart and really trying to examine what it is that my interests are and why am I interested in them. My main goal after graduating NASCAD is continuing my process and being able to find the facilities necessary to continue making the work I want to. I feel like Seamus' work would be a perfect fit in this fun house. There's so much joy in the colors that he chooses. And the same can be said about our next artist, who finds comfort in the vibrant hues she selects for her abstract designs. Take a look. When I'm manic, I tend to have sort of a lot of ideas and get really, really excited about them. And I wish I could like work on everything at once. Often my colors will either reflect how I'm feeling at the time or I'll use color as a way to sort of perk myself up or make myself feel better. I don't know, do you want me to get really into pigment? Cause I could like nerd out. <laughs> Whether it be my textiles or my digital work, it always either references paint in some way or has a painterly aspect to it. Art has always been at the core for me, um, a sort of coping mechanism. I'm bipolar and I've always had really bad anxiety and have had bouts of depression throughout my life and art has always been a tool I've had. I mean, sometimes it can be a struggle for sure, but I definitely wouldn't trade being bipolar because 
I feel things more intensely than other people do. And it also means that when I work on something, anything, I do it with a lot of intensity and passion. Sometimes when I get really into a project, yeah, I will just really focus on it and not sleep or leave the studio for days on end. Sometimes I'll have seven or eight paintings around me and be working on all of them at the same time. My art talks a lot about nature and technology and where those two things collide. So this series here is my alien organism series. And a lot of the shapes and forms in these reference jellyfish, seaweed, fungi, lichen. And due to the really bright colors, they look almost like they're otherworldly. Growing up, I definitely spent a lot of time inside on the computer when it was pouring rain, which was like eight months of the year. <laughs> and then when it was nice out, being outside. So sort of the way my brain dealt with growing up with like 90s cartoons, angel fire sites, and like the internet aesthetics of the early 90s and like early 2000s, and the beautiful nature I was surrounded by. So it's sort of melding all those feelings and senses together into one thing. The Glitch Zip uh, series, the term glitch refers to glitch art, which is a kind of art created using the flaws in technology. Any art that references the internet or digital aesthetic can be considered post-internet art. I would consider post-internet art really interesting as far as how it affects the art world. It gives artists a lot of agency. Not very long ago, you kind of had to rely on the gallery systems. They sort of tend to gear towards a specific kind of person that they represent, and that often excludes minorities and women, um, people of color and queer people. So I am very interested in how the internet gives agency to these people to show and sell work. And I think also, as far as a viewer, it makes art more accessible. Sharing your art with the world is a very vulnerable thing to do. And it's always hard for me to be very vulnerable with people. Feels really nice to get feedback from people when they connect to my work or understand sort of what I was getting at, especially when it's an abstract painting and I'm not articulating it in any sort of language aside from a visual code and people are still reading that and understanding what it's meant to mean. It's very satisfying. Coming up, these may look like traditional Chinese landscape paintings, but look again, they're actually the Bay of Fundy. Right now, I'm about to enter a different kind of magical space. Every room in the Fun House is a unique universe created by a different artist. This next one is by Paul Jackson, and it's inspired by Black Mirror, Alfred Hitchcock, and a Canadian musician named Bad Child. Let's go meet Paul and learn more about his surreal installation. Hey, Paul. Hi. Thanks so much for meeting with me. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm very excited, but first I need to ask you a question. As somebody who's coming here for the first time uh, and doesn't know too much about this place, how would you describe the Fun House for me? I would describe it as an acid trip minus the acid. <laughs> so something you can come yeah. and carefree experience some crazy environments, um, see things that you wouldn't have seen before, and get some good ideas on how to decorate your house. Yeah. yeah. Very cool, very cool. Uh, so you are an illustrator. I am. The majority of your work is black and white drawings. Correct. So what came to your mind when they approached you to design a room? Well, this is obviously a very different experience for me because I work on pieces of paper and canvases, very flat. Um, a completely different canvas, essentially. Um, a 3D canvas with sound and light. It's, it's a very interesting way to create art. Well, I am super excited to see this room, so can we go now? Absolutely. All right. Good. Oh, 
Oh yeah, this is creepy. I like it. Oh, I'm sinking furniture. Sick. All these uh, features are AR enabled, which is augmented reality. So when you get an app, you can animate them, which I will show you. Please do. That's sick. His face melts. Oh my god. And this one down here. Oh, cool. That's really dope. Whoa. Wow. And this one should also work. Oh, there you go. Uh, nice. I love it. So Bad Child has a record called Free Trial. Mm. And the way he explains it is free trial is essentially going on a date with someone. So when you're going on a date, you're trialing them to see if you want to take on the full package. And this is like a visual, a visualized version of a sci-fi date that has gone wrong and is sinking into this different dimension. And then you've got a sort of Black Mirror inspired um, sci-fi area where you would choose your partner's face. And, huh. and it's all kind of glitching out and breaking and sinking and, and everything's just going wrong. Yeah. Take, take a seat, by the way. Okay, thank you. I will. So this is the part to show that it's failing and sinking and it's corrupted. The date is no longer no longer valid. I'm gonna try expired. I feel harshly judged. <laughs> that's so, yeah, so that's, cool. that's the weird one. That's you. really cool. I think that interactive element really challenges part of what you know a lot of people think about when they think about the fun house, which is the Instagram element, right? Exactly, like this yeah. now changes it. And was that something that you really wanted to do is to take it a little bit beyond that part? Of course, yeah. I didn't want it just to be a quick Instagram throwaway moment. Um, I th I've made it quite hard for people to get their Instagram moment as right. well. Even though there's mirrors everywhere, like I don't have a problem with it, but mm -hmm. I didn't want it to be disposable. Mm -hmm. I want you to take away a little bit more from it, you know? So this space isn't permanent. No. So what is it going to feel like when it all comes down? Um, good question. I should see it more as like a, a movie set. So like once you've filmed the movie on a movie set, the film becomes the legacy. So I guess in a sense, I could go back on my disposable Instagram comment and say that that is actually the only way it does get kept. And that is the, the, the way it lives on. So I suppose that is actually an important part of it is to come watch people's documentation of it and how they interpret it. 19 years ago, my husband, he said he wanted to immigrate to Canada. First time I landing to New Brunswick, I tell my husband, I said, I need to paint what I feeling. I feeling I just walk in a painting. It's a big, big painting. I think I learned something from, chi uh, from, from China. I also learned something from Canada. I want to be a, a bridge between the gap of two, uh, two countries, it's a different culture. I think it's destiny, let me come here, I have some destiny. My name is uh, Xu Dan, I'm a visual artist from New Brunswick. When I go to outside, I just uh, feel I meet my lover. What the master they, they, they used? They used the, the face, not sit on the one point to paint that. They always paint just panorama. And then when you finish that, the feeling is uh, like a bird. My painting always has three points. First, look up, look up what I see, the tree, very top tree. And then I flowing, flowing, okay, I see a little far away, I see some people and see some animal, but I still go floating higher and then I see very far away, I see very long distance. So when I put the three of them together, it's a Chinese panorama. So for us, Chinese painting, a little like literature. The log and the tree, they're against each other, but they help each other. They have some story in there. 
So I find the emotion in the outside is uh, very different, just like my animal. If some animal in the in the room and some animal in the wood, there is it's total different. It's the the personality and the feeling, the spirit is very different. It's a, it's a documenting something, what you see and what you're feeling, yeah. So every time when I um, go outside, I just uh, open my, my hand as okay, use my hand. Okay, give me a hug, talk, because I'm, I'm so isolated, I want to talk to you. And you also have a lot of stories, want to talk to me. You can use any skill, not just Chinese, not just the, the oil painting, not just West style or East style. We can mix together. We just, I just want to honestly and truly to catch a recording and documenting the spirit nature. So I hold my, my, my brush, I just uh, catch anything I see, the, mo the motion and the windy and the sunshine, it gave me the feeling I just catch a recording on my paper. That's it. When I show people what my painting, I want the people to realize how beautiful is this land. When you see something every day, it's easy to take it for granted. So it's really nice when an artist like Dan Shu comes along and takes that everyday thing, makes it magical. Coming up. Tattoos for me is like my story. It's like my therapy. This summer at the CBC Music Festival, there was a lineup stretching across the grass as people patiently waited to get a custom-made temp tattoo from T. Fergus. It's hard to imagine now, but there was once a time when T wasn't sure the tattoo world had space for a black queer woman. She's since proved the misconception wrong. Take a look. When I come to tattoo, I like to create the, the energy of the space. This is how I kind of create the energy and the vibe. Available. Honestly, I was so happy when you filled in the spot. Yeah, it, like, it completed me. <laughs> My name is Maya Fergus. Everyone calls me T. I'm a multi-dimensional artist. I paint, I illustrate, I take photos, and I'm a tattoo artist. Tattoos for me is like my story. I, I like reminding myself of experiences. I like reminding myself of growth. It's like my therapy. I feel like a lot of the design process starts from my own personal experience. This is the fun part. This is where everything kind of like comes together. I would describe my work as magical, universal. <laughs> Part of the work that I do is try to make you use your imagination and look beyond what we just see right here. My private studio is in Kensington now, which is super exciting. I've worked in Kensington before at um, tattoo shops, but I've, I've always wanted to have my own. When I got into tattooing 10 years ago, I mean, like I said, I didn't ever think of tattooing because I just never saw myself in tattooing. It just wasn't that kind of a world um, where I was like, oh yeah, oh, there's a queer black woman tattooer. It didn't exist to me. Um, but when I was asked to tattoo, if I wanted to learn how to tattoo, that was the reason I said yes. I wanted to see myself represented. 
that I was like, oh, it's gonna look amazing, because you know. <laughs> but like, I was like, this is like next level. Yeah, it looks sick. Some of the stereotypes around tattooing black skin are you can't get details or you can't get color um, or you just can't get the tattoo. <laughs> like all the little like detailing, I like the line work. Um, it's very simple and clean, um, so it works really well on my skin as well. So. People thinking that because you're darker, you need to like press into the skin so that it shows up. And you know, so many people of color are like, traumatized and like scarred and keloid because of this. My goal was to create a space where you can just go and feel good being yourself and not feel judged and just be okay in, in your skin. It's part of my contribution of reconnecting a lot of people to themselves. If there's a Canadian artist that you think should be on CBC Arts Exhibitionist, let me know. Send me a message on social media. Our handle is at CBC Arts. Tune in next week for another deep dive into the fascinating work of Canadian artists. But for now, I'm gonna keep exploring this fun house. Peace. <laughs>